Okay, so this is uh, as of this minute, November 14th. You know, this is the number of cases, and obviously, um, I guess this is a new record for us to we've never had more than 100,000 cases. Frankly, the peak before was in July of 60,000 cases a day, and um, on November 13th, we had 181,000, so three times the number of cases as the peak in July. And as you remember, April, when everybody was freaking out about toilet paper, there were 34,000 cases a day. So we are, um, you know, five times higher than when people were freaking out. Um, and then if you look at uh, deaths, deaths are up to, it used to be just under a thousand or around a thousand. And uh, obviously now we are at 1,400, uh, well, 1,389 deaths on November 13th. And that is a 34% jump in the 14-day average. And you see number of hospitalizations also <clears throat> going up by 41%. So... I know the president likes to talk about, oh, well, the only reason we have more cases is because we're testing more. Um, I don't know if that means, like, did you expect to see more people showing up in the hospital and dying just because there's more tests? Um, but, you know, that's the president's math. So where in the country is this the most uh, concerning? Let's take a look at... Uh, where we're seeing the biggest issues. And I think I'm going to go to here and hopefully you can see the US map, which is loading. <laughs> Come on, map. Seriously, there it is. Where are the hot spots? Definitely, and this is as defined the number of cases per 100,000 people. So this is adjusted for population size. Because if you look at just total cases, you would think, oh, this is just a problem. It's a coastal problem. This is not a problem of like good sort of uh, rural Americans, right? This is just those big cities like Seattle and Los Angeles and New, New York and Miami. But when you look at, but that's just because there's more people that live there. Now, if you look at per capita uh, and you look at the hotspots, the daily cases per 100,000, now, and you adjust for population size, you see, oh, wait a minute, this isn't just some coastal, multicultural, elite uh, New York City, Miami problem, right? This is a problem in the heartland. Uh, and remember when the president first dealt with this, he said, I'm not going to institute policies for places like Wisconsin if this is a problem in uh, New York City. You know, you can't apply the same rules. Well, it turns out that humans, humans in Wisconsin and Michigan are just as susceptible to contracting a coronavirus as humans in San Francisco's Chinatown and New York City's Chinatown. Turns out that humanity doesn't care what race or party you belong to, or whether you're in a blue state or a red state, that virus is going to get you if you don't take active measures to mitigate it. You know, it's not a political thing. This is just like freaking, uh, right, you know. You guys know. All right. Now, if you look at, uh, so that's that's the per capita. Now, what I wanted to show was also uh, how it looks over the rest of the world. I mean, we're not alone. This is the global count here. Globally, um, there are 53.4 million cases uh, that have been reported, and there were 650,000 new cases uh, on November 13th, and almost 10,000 deaths uh, globally 
on November 13th. And about 10 per- about 15% of them came from America. And that's up 36%. So this is not a, you know, kind of like US only problem. And this is where you see Europe kind of like took their eye off the ball in the summer. I remember I, I, as you guys, some of you know, I lived in Europe for the last four years and moved out of there the summer. And when I moved out in the summer, people were traveling uh, like, it, like it was back to normal. And this is what happens. Um, so that's, uh, you know, Russia, which claims they have a vaccine is not looking good either. And then when you look at the per capita, I mean, this is just, this is just not, this is, this is, this is looking bad. Now, if you're in Japan, you're actually looking okay. You're only had losing a one in 67,000 people. Uh, if you're in Korea, you're only losing one in a hundred thousand people. But if you're in America, you're losing one in 1,000. So you guys catch that? One in 1,000 are dying in America. One in 67,000 are dying in Japan. And one in 100,000 are dying in South Korea. Uh, One in 3 million are dying in Taiwan. But again, one in 1,000 are dying in the U.S. Now, you might be saying, well, those Taiwanese, those Japanese, you know, they're kind of crazy. They're always wearing masks. Well, why not? If it helps prevent you from dying, just wear a freaking mask. I know it doesn't look super cool, but being healthy is cool. Being healthy is patriotic. Now, you might be saying like, well, it could be cultural differences. Those Japanese, they don't like to shake hands, like to bow. You know, we need to we need to shake hands. We need to hug. Well, uh, you know, we're North Americans. We're a different culture. Okay, I I see that argument. But then you got to wonder, like, well, why are we dying three times more than the Canadians? They're one in three thousand. We're one in 1,000. Are the Canadians somehow turning into a bunch of Japanese? Are the Canadians starting to speak uh, Mandarin? Are they eating, you know, kimchi chige? No, they're North Americans. And they only have one in 3,400 dying. We have one in 1,000 dying. We have one in 31 people infected. They have one in 129 people infected. So um, it's not just like, oh, the Asians are hardcore and they they are anti-freedom or whatever. Yeah, the Canadians, you know what? They have a national policy. It's not that big of a deal. If you have a national pandemic, maybe there should be a national policy. Maybe you shouldn't just have every state uh, have like dealer's choice. Uh any rate. So uh, the other thing I want to show you guys is the uh, infection rate, not just the number of cases, because, uh, you know, a lot of MAGA people will say, oh, you know why we have more cases, Tom? It's because we test more. We are the best in testing. That's why we have more cases. America. OK, we do test more. We do test more. But explain this to me. Explain this chart to me, my MAGA geniuses. Why is our positivity test rate going up? Hmm? If you test more, the percent of people testing positive should not be going up. If anything, it should be going down. So let's just be clear. Just... A little less than a month ago, for every 100 people you tested, you got about 4.8 coming positive. Now, for every 100 people you test, you have 11.7 testing positive. Why are all these people coming in, getting tested, now showing positive, double the number of people 
who are showing positive last time, even when you account for number of tests, because you're dividing the positive test cases by the number of total tests taken. So no longer should be affected by number of tests conducted. If, if anything, it should be going down because as you test more and more of the population, in theory, if this has gone away and we've already turned the corner, we shouldn't be finding all these people with positive results. And yet every day, there's more and more people as a percentage who are testing positive. Now, let's be fair. Let's not hate on America, okay? Because we we are not the only country that has a problem with this. So if you look at Canada, um, how is this not alphabetical? Seriously? Where the hell is Canada? There it is. Oh, it is alphabetical. Okay. Canada is also going up, even with their kind of better mitigation. Now, they're at 7% and we're at 12%, or they're at 8% and we're at 12%. So they are about, we have about 50% worse of a job than they are doing. But they're also dealing with this. And I think this is one of those things where it's uh, uh, because it's getting colder and people are hanging out inside. Now, if you look at, let's say, uh, let's see if I can pull up Taiwan. Taiwan, on the other hand, has managed somehow to really keep a lid on their infection rate close to uh positive test rate close close to one percent um you know right here that's the that's a comparison us canada and taiwan now we talked about the uh europeans kind of taking their eye off the ball so let's look at our brothers in uh the united kingdom The United Kingdom is almost as bad as us, but still, they're more like in the Canada category. Jesus, who is worse than us for positivity? Probably the French. I think the French have done a pretty crap job. Yeah, look at the French, dude. What is going on there? Jesus. 18% positivity test rate. Uh, well, about, let's see if... Uh, Switzerland is here. Yeah, uh, no, the Swiss data may not be in here. Oh, there it is. Yeah, love it. And Sweden. I know a lot of MAGA people like Sweden. Let's talk about Sweden. So Sweden is pretty much almost as bad as us at 10%. Switzerland is freaking uh, like 30% positivity test rate. Are you serious? I mean, are you serious? So this is where when I was in Switzerland, they had it under control, but then they wanted to reopen. Oh, you're asking what website this is. It is uh, ourworldindata.org, and I'll put a link in the chat. And I'll also put a banner here. If you guys are curious about that. Um, so... Net-net, uh, this is a huge problem. It is uh, not going to go away. And while we're all encouraged by the vaccine, a couple things. One, it hasn't been approved yet. Two, people need to get the vaccine. And we're going to need about 200 million people to get the vaccine. And I think they said the first uh, installment might be maybe... Uh, millions of vaccines the, in the in the next few months. So um, even for frontline workers, I don't think it's it, they're all going to get vaccinated in January. So um, you guys got to hunker down. We all have to uh, kind of prepare for this thing being with us most of 2021, sadly. And we're going to need a leader that can make some hard calls and maybe take a page out of Taiwan's book and South and South Korea's book and don't do what uh, France is doing because they're sucking. Um, 
So any rate, uh, the other the only other thing I would share is um, the election's done. Uh, I know a lot of people are saying there's fraud, but you know if you think there's fraud, then just follow the Trump um, court cases because they're being asked to present evidence, and they've lost nine cases on in one day uh, in Friday on Friday alone. So uh, I think we're done, hopefully. And we have about 68 days till the inauguration. One thing that I will call out is um, John Kelly put out a pretty good and interesting statement the other day where he's saying uh, that the Trump administration's unwillingness to cooperate with the Biden transition could become a issue of national security. So Again, <clears throat> this is not uh, some snowflake from, you know, Berkeley, California saying this. This is U.S. Marine Corps General John Kelly and former hand-picked White House Chief of Staff under Donald Trump. And what's he saying? The delay in transitioning is an increasing national security and health crisis. It costs the current administration nothing, nothing to start to brief Biden, Harris, chief of staff, and cabinet members. The downside to not briefing the new Biden team could be catastrophic to our people, regardless of who they voted for. Just as important are getting the landing teams into various departments and agencies that protect Americans, our health, and our way of life. Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense, Intel Community, Health and Human Services, so they can begin to build the critical situational awareness essential for a smooth transition of presidents, if required. So this is this is not some... Uh, crazy BLM, Antifa activists. This is a U.S. Marine Corps general who worked for President Trump in the Trump administration, first as a Secretary of Homeland Security, second as Chief of Freaking Staff, and prior to that as General of the United States Marine Corps. And he's saying that this president is jeopardizing American lives by not cooperating with the transition. Think about this, guys. Think about this. If you were at work and you're getting a new CEO and the old outgoing CEO is saying like, no, 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 I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to show him where all the files are. I don't want to brief him on the latest data. Like, I'm staying. And then on January uh, 20th, it all has to happen kind of overnight. Do you really think that's going to be a smooth transition? Um, this is just this is just terrifying that we have someone who refuses to admit that he lost. But even if you if you want to just kind of keep playing this game that you won, and you're going to win in the courts. And I know Rudy Giuliani is on it and he's leading the charge. You could still do the transition work. And and then if the courts grant you the presidency and, the, and then, then fine, then the transition work is no skin off your back. You stay in office. But most likely you're not going to win and you're going to lose. So even Obama invited Trump into the White House like the next day, even Hillary conceded like the same night. Uh, a lot of people say that because the of the Florida recount uh, with Bush v. Gore because it took longer for the Bush administration to ramp up. It contributed to the 9-11 crisis because the intelligence um, departments weren't able to transition smoothly. So shame on Bill Clinton for that. Um, but let's not make the same mistake twice. So at any rate, um, that is the uh, the summary. Uh, please hook a brother up and uh, like 
and share this video now. <laughs> and uh, I'll see you guys uh, tomorrow. I'll be interviewing. Oh, let's see who I have on tomorrow. Oh, I think I have a COVID expert on tomorrow. Um, let me see. I still need to confirm because it was booked well in advance. But I'm pretty sure, yeah, we have uh, Eva Lee coming on. And you might be wondering who's Eva Lee. Uh, she is a researcher um, from right, uh, with a degree from Rice University and a PhD, uh, applied mathematician, but I think she has some analysis on COVID. Um, she's a professor at uh, Georgia Institute of Technology, and uh, I think we'll be talking to her about her work uh, collaborating with the Center for Disease Control uh, on Defenses Against uh, Pandemic and uh, getting her thoughts on what's going on with this whole COVID thing, because it's clearly not just a U.S. problem, and what should we do going forward. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye, nerds. See ya. I just want to uh, thank some of the members uh, of this channel who make this content possible. So if you find this uh, useful, please remember to um, like and share. And if you are not a subscriber, come join the family. And then if you really want to help uh, keep this channel going, because now that the election's over, you know, probably not going to have as huge audiences as we did the day after the election, which was nuts. Um, but uh, consider becoming a member. You can just hit the join link on YouTube. And here are the people who uh, have already done that. So let's start with uh, the highest level. At the EVP level, we have Kristen Slevin. So thank you, Kristen, for your support. And then we have at the VP level, we have Mindful Skeptics, which is Boyce, Laura Lane, Patrick Dunn, Joshua Frick, Fat Lamb, V Lamb, and JM Sap. Thank you guys. You guys have been with us a long time. Uh, Boyce is a recent uh, uh, VP. So welcome to the VP level, Boyce, uh, Mindful Skeptics. So then we have Hardcore, which is the next level. And we have some new members, Stat Nerd and Dean L. And Robert Wu, and then some long timers, Yang Deng, Susan, Mona, Landline, Mr. History, Byram, Jekalego, Kirsch, Phoenix Congress, not DK Metcalf, Tracy, David, Gene, and Mike. And then at the entry level, which is only a dollar ninety-nine per month, I think, verified nerd. Um, we've got Ira, Miles, Huey, Nell. Stephen, Brad, Jalopy, Aaron, Emma, Brenda, Anna, Joel, Spirited, KM, Bike, James, Blair, Jessica, Ryan, Rasta, Tony, Vaughn, Elizabeth, Christina, Lisa, Shake and Make, Doris, Nell, Mike, Gail, Richard, Roger, Ben, Lori, Soldier, Emerald, Jadwiga, Sophia, Hitachi, your mom and <laughs> your mom. Uh, Peter, Arez, Sugar, Albert, Brandon, yes, Brian, Helen, and Lisa. So thank you to all the members who make this channel possible. All of the money does not go to my uh, glamorous lifestyle. It goes to supporting the content, like our podcast hosting fees, uh, the streaming software I'm using right now, um, uh, also like some design costs for our merch. Uh, and then going forward, if I can save up enough, we also did a big ad campaign on Yang Speaks to promote the channel, and we'll be doing future ad campaigns, basically grow the audience. The bigger audience we can get, we can attract even higher profile guests for our one-on-one -on -one interviews. And also it helps us support the candidates in the 2022 and 2024 cycle because we'll have a bigger audience and can channel more energy in their direction.